uh, speak today. I believe you all have um, the official bio of Peter, but I do have to complete the formality to read the bio will be here. So uh, Professor Peter Piedi is the assistant professor and assistant program director of the uh, Master of Global Political Economy program of this university, uh, where he teaches political economy and political uh, psychology. His published work has focused on the role of ideas in politics, and his research has been presented at a conference in Asia, Europe, South America, the United States, etc. Actually, he's having a very interesting background before joining uh, CUHK. He had been practicing as a lawyer, and then um, he has been teaching in the University of California, uh, um, uh, in Korea. So it's not very usual for a lawyer who chose to study and get back to the academia afterwards, so I'm sure there will be a lot of interesting story. And he had also studied extensively on the role of media. Actually, we had been discussing about how Donald Trump had an impact on social media and how we can tackle this very important issue nowadays. Social evolution, political psychology, and media in democracy. Do you, do you really understand what it means? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you don't. So that's why we have to listen to the experts go on this very important topic nowadays. So please join me to welcome Professor Peter Gay. Thank you. Thank you very much. See if this works. Yeah. So yeah, I do have a background in law, so you know that you can trust everything that I say <laughs> as a lawyer. Uh, and I did my PhD in Orange County, California, which all of you probably know is the intellectual capital of the world. Uh, so another reason to trust that I have to say. Um, so the uh, the image over here is a painting by uh, Carlos Enriquez. I, first saw it in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Havana, Cuba. And I think it kind of summarizes the argument of the book. Uh, you can see in the, the foreground an emaciated family. Uh, and then in the background, you might not be able to see, but there's a, a little poster with a uh, pig in a top hat, and it just says, vote. Uh, and he's kind of making the point that democracy is not just about having the ability to vote. There are other requirements, like having the luxury and, and time and effort to uh, investigate different candidates, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought this was a good image uh, to introduce the, the argument overall. Uh, so just to get oriented, uh, recently in political science, there was this book uh, that made a bit of a splash in some circles, uh, basically arguing that political science needs to focus on ideas, not just demographic categories. Uh, so it had two targets. Uh, it's been described one dismally ideological, and that's the kind of rational choice, median voter uh, theorem approach, which borrowed from neoclassical economic, economics and kind of uh, ended up playing a, a uh, defensive role for US democracy, or really existing democracy, saying that everything is perfectly fine, uh, the system in practice works just the way it's supposed to in theory. Uh, the other target is deliberative democracy, but I'm going to leave that aside. And basically they say the reason why these theories don't accurately describe the way democracy works is because they don't take into account our cognitive biases and limitations. Basically, they're ignorant of psychology. And they say that uh, intergroup bias, our, our species groupishness, uh, better explains political phenomena today that these simplified models don't do a very good job at explaining really existing democracy. Uh, they should have borrowed from social psychology rather than borrowing from neoclassical economics. Uh, there's a deeper problem here that I'm just going to touch on briefly rather than get into because this could take a, a while. There's a kind of vestigial positivism within US political uh, science. Uh, philosophers of science have abandoned this view for decades and decades, but nonetheless, it still remains the dominant approach uh, among political scientists, sadly. Uh, I think the evolutionary approach requires a philosophy of science that's more realistic, and that's the approach that I uh, try to apply in, in my book. Uh, first of all, there are other people in political science, not very many, uh, I could count them probably on one hand as far as I know, uh, who are also arguing that we should look at ideas and treat ideas and beliefs seriously. Uh, one of them is the political theorist Jeffrey Friedman, uh, and I just want to uh, highlight one aspect of his argument where he says that uh, intellectual biography, or the history of particular agents' beliefs, would be a more effective political science to try to explain why people do what they do in politics, like why did they vote for Donald Trump? 
It's not that they look at their skin, realize, oh, I don't have very much melanin. I should therefore vote for Donald Trump. Uh, they have ideas and beliefs that lead them to believe that Donald Trump will be a better candidate, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, at the risk of personal embarrassment, I will follow uh, Jeffrey Friedman's advice and go into a bit of intellectual biography myself, uh, because I think this illustrates the epistemology or the epistemological approach that I take in the book. Uh, so, for me, this was uh, this is the most important epistemological question to ask about politics. Uh, why is it that there are truths on one side of the mountain that are false on the other? Truths in China that are false on the other side of the Himalayas, or truths uh, in China that are false on the other side of the Pacific. Uh, so when I started getting interested in politics, the first thing that really did it for me was reading this book, Women, Priests, and Other Fantasies. It might be the first time you've heard of it. Uh, it's an ultra-Orthodox uh, right-wing uh, Catholic priest writing about issues of religion and politics. I read this when I was around 12 years old. I found it on my parents' shelf. And this inspired in me a, a deep desire to learn more about politics. Then I started uh, listening to Rush Limbaugh, who's a far right-wing uh, radio personality in the United States, uh, kind of the, one of the pioneers in right-wing media. Uh, this was before Fox News. Uh, I found his show very entertaining, it, it explained the political world to me, and I built up my understanding of politics by listening to his show. Then I got interested in reading more, so I, I read the ultra-Orthodox ultra Catholic magazine First Things, and the far-right uh, political magazine National Review. And uh, during this time I built up a political and religious worldview that explained everything that I thought I needed to know about politics and how the world worked. Uh, this is a, a little quote from uh, The Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. The main character uh, uh, abandons Catholicism, um, and something similar happened to me. Basically, as, uh, the, as James Joyce writes, Catholicism is a very logical and coherent intellectual system. So if one part of it breaks down, uh, the whole thing collapses. And that's uh, sort of what I experienced in my teenage years. Uh, there were some logical problems that I had with it, the whole system collapsed. So I had to then go and rebuild from scratch an entirely different worldview. Uh, so his friend here says, you know, then did you become a Protestant? And he says, well, why would I exchange something that's absurd but logical and coherent for something that's absurd but illogical and incoherent? So this, is, this kind of reminds me of, of how what I was faced with. Uh, I was a conservative. I abandoned that. Now should I become a liberal? Uh, well, that struck me as, as also uh, illogical and incoherent because this was around the turn of the millennium. This was when we were experiencing peak market fundamentalism or peak market triumphalism in the US. Uh, this was just referred to by uh, Amber A. Lee Frost in the Columbia Journalism Review as Fukuyamaism. So Fukuyama famously said, you know, we've reached the end of history, there's no more ideological battle anymore. Uh, now it's just about tweaking the capitalist system, and that's the only question that we need to be interested in. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, that did not really catch my interest, so I didn't really fully become a United States-style liberal. I just had no political ideology for a while. Then, again, random uh, uh, accidents happen. You get introduced to other influ intellectual influences, and they help shape your resulting worldview. So one random accident was just having a friend in college who introduced me to a uh, left-wing writer, you might have heard of, Noam Chomsky, who writes a lot about US foreign policy. And of course, because I had been steeped in far-right ideas and beliefs, I read this book and my first reaction was, you know, this is obviously bullshit. This can't be true. This is insane. The US is, you know, predominantly uh, seeking after more power no, we, we care about human rights and democracy. I mean, this is just, you don't even question this in the United States. Uh, so what I decided to do is I would read more from that perspective, and then I would go find the people who had comprehensively critiqued it, debunked it, and shown all of the errors in this view. Uh, perhaps sadly, perhaps not, that doesn't exist. Uh, nobody's really done that. I've, I've sought it out uh, for years now. I can't find a single comprehensive critique of this particular 
uh, view of US foreign policy. If you know something, please do let me know. I'd love to join the, the winning team. Um, but <laughs> until then, uh, so anyway, this is just an example of, I think, what happens to everyone in, their, in the development of their ideology. It, you might not have had your ideology collapse and have to build another one, but some sort of process like this occurred whereby you built, over time, a, a narrative that explains the world. So obviously for someone who had his worldview collapse and then have to build another one, I was incredibly interested in this question, why do people believe what they believe about politics. So I tried to see what uh, scientists had, had done to try to answer this question. Uh, so first, the, the most important thing to start with is an investigation of what information is. Because ideas, beliefs, they're all composed of information at the base. So there's, there's three main areas of research that focus on this question. What is information? How did we get so much of it as a species? Uh, in terms of technology, why are we here sitting in a room with computers and, and glass and steel rather than you know, out in the forest uh, around a campfire? Uh, and then how do we select the information that we have available to us? So this kind of sets up a view of looking at the realm of ideas as an ecology. And then you have to ask, how does this ecology operate? Just as if you were looking at you know, uh, uh, desert environments. How does that desert ecology operate? What are, the, what are the main players in this environment? So you can kind of separate the, uh, if you so choose, I, I thought this was a, a good way of, of dividing up the, uh, the relevant forces in the ecology of information, into supply and demand. Uh, on the demand side, you have the human mind. What ideas are going to be more attractive to us given features of our psychology. Uh, so that would be our evolved psychology, but also our culturally influenced psychology, how the culture that we're born into influences the development of our psychological traits. Uh, and then on the supply side, the primary source of political information is the news media. We might also have friends that tell us things about politics, family, etc., schools, but the primary overwhelming source is the news media. So once you set up this theoretical perspective, then the next place to look is the evolutionary history of our species to see what sort of marks it left on our psychology. Uh, and then looking at research in social psychology, which particularly focuses on how biases operate to influence the way we process, uh, absorb, and recall information. Uh, then uh, between the demand side and the supply side, you have the question of uh, does what's available in the supply, in the news media, actually get into our brains? That is, does the news media actually uh, affect the way we believe about politics, what we believe about politics? Uh, to some people, especially you know, media researchers in Brazil who have experience with the dictatorship that controlled the media there, uh, there's not much questioning there. In the US, this is an open question, so I, I went into the research on uh, media effects. Then on the supply side, the, the main uh, area of research that describes forces operating that affect what supply of information where we have access to, uh, that's the political economy of media, which I'll get into briefly. And then lastly, comparative media studies that looks at how differences in media systems around the world uh, influence people differentially, how uh, a system with, you know, some features have these effects on public opinion and systems with other features have other effects on public opinion. So uh, one first interesting question, I put this in very scary font, uh, this is from Robert Dahl, he's not actually arguing this, but he's bringing this up as a possibility, he's saying that if elites in a system can plug in their preferences to that system, and then get out of that system what they want, then plebiscitary democracy, democracy with voting, is substantially equivalent to the model of totalitarian rule. It's basically totalitarian rule with one extra step. Instead of just telling people what they have to do, you first have to plug your preferences in the system, get them to want what you want, and then you get what you want. So there are a lot of arguments that this is actually what's happening in the United States today. Uh, so there's the argument that uh, money exerts an undue influence on the US political system. 
Uh, in terms of empirical evidence, this is the best supported position, actually, the, the evidence of uh, the influence that uh, money people and organizations have on political outcomes is substantial. Evidence for the influence of uh, people without significant wealth is you can't measure it. There's no measurable impact of their preferences on outcomes in the US political system. Uh, so you end up with this sort of view that you're basically left with just a choice between uh, various forms of corporate rule in the US. Uh, as the great American writer Gordon Hall put it, uh, in the US there's one party, the property party, with two right wings, the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, and then you have uh, critiques of US foreign policy that also accord with this conjecture by Robert Dahl. Uh, there's another one over here. Uh, basically that whatever elites want uh, from the political system in terms of foreign policy, they get through their influence over the media. Potentially, so let's see. Uh, there's a lot of objections to this view, however. Uh, a lot of these objections are similar to uh, the, the, the quip attributed to Stalin, where somebody said, um, was arguing that the Pope might stop him doing something, and he said, yeah, how many divisions does the Pope control? You know, is the Pope's army going to invade? You know, ha ha, that's ridiculous. Well, there are people who make a similar argument with the media, that the media doesn't actually have any significant power. So they'll say, you know, how can the US media uh, function as a propaganda system if uh, there's no evidence of a conspiratorial cabal uh, dominating the media, telling journalists what to write, uh, no Illuminati group uh, you know, determining everything that goes on, uh, that journalists instead are largely free to say what they like. Uh, and that journalists often take adversarial positions towards government and corporations in the US. Um, that the US is an open society without censorship. Uh, and that media critics, like myself, are likely to be adherents of uh, non-mainstream ideological perspectives. And so the reason why they criticize the system is that they're just upset that more people don't agree with them. So they say, ah, oh, it must be because the media is brainwashing them. And if it weren't for the media, everyone would agree with me. So these are the, the common criticisms to any view that the media in the United States exerts significant political uh, impact. Okay, so let's going back to that, that uh, schema of how I'm, I'm making this uh, uh, examination. So first with information. What is information? It's not a thing. It's the physical arrangement of things. So we tend to think of information as something ethereal, uh, immaterial, floating through the air. But it's always in some form of physical substrate. So whether it's uh, the sound waves that I'm producing now, whether it's the, uh, uh, the organization of matter in the hard drive and the computer that's then showing up on the screen, and then light waves going into your eyes, changing uh, the order of matter in your brain. All, of, all information is always physical. That leads to the, the, the most important conclusion, in my opinion, which is facts have no wings. People aren't going to know something if information isn't transported to them, or unless they, they create that information themselves. But when we're talking about politics, we're talking about events that, that happen far, far away from us uh, that we don't have any direct experience with, unless we happen to work in a capital city, in government, uh, we rely on this provider of logistics for physical information, which is the media. Uh, so the, the three main areas of research that actually try to answer this question to some extent of, of what is information and why do people believe what they believe are social evolution theory, schema research in social psychology, and the social representations tradition in uh, more European style social psychology. So social evolution theory basically uh, is saying that the same basic evolutionary process or evolutionary algorithm that has produced the massive diversity of biological life forms on this planet is also at the root of why we have such a massive diversity of intellectual products, ideas, beliefs, technologies, religions, uh, worldviews, etc that when you have variation, selection, and retention uh, in a system like the realm of the intellect or the realm of biology, that produces increased complexity over time. Uh, can't get into it too much, but one 
uh, key example is this idea of conceptual blending uh, that's pioneered by two guys from UCSD in San Diego. Uh, they say that the human brain uh, does something very similar to sexual recombination in biology, where we commonly will take two or more ideas, take aspects of those ideas, and combine them, as in the example of uh, intellectual property, uh, something where we, we know property, it's something real, but we can combine it with the product of the intellect, and now we have the concept of intellectual property, and we have many, many lawyers who make their living uh, dealing with disputes over intellectual property. Um, then, within the social psychological tradition, you have schema research, and this basically looks at how the brain uh, encodes, uh, uh, uses, and remembers information. And the basic picture is that when you learn something, or you, you form a memory, uh, you encode a concept in your neural network, and then that concept is attached to other related concepts. Uh, there's a whole lot of interesting uh, effects of this that the, the experiments in this area of research uh, draw out. But the most important one that I want to uh, mention briefly here is that when we learn something new or we, we hear a story and encode it in our memory, we attach that piece of information with uh, our own personal memories and our emotions, our affect. So for instance, take uh, two college students who are in college and for the first time they're being taught, uh, say, Marxist theory of exploitation. And one student is from Guatemala, he's from a uh, poor family, that, a landless peasant family working on a large plantation. Uh, when he learns this concept, he's going to encode it in a schema, in a, in a neural network, where it's connected to memories of him growing up, seeing his family suffer, uh, his memories of working very hard, his memories of being deprived of material goods, etc. Then take another student who learns the exact same concept, but this student is from a family that owns the company that owns the plantation, who's never experienced any really uh, tough experience with hard work. Maybe the only memory that attaches to this new concept of exploitation is maybe a memory of hearing his parents complain about being taxed and being exploited by the government, some of their labor is taken by the government. So the, the, the most important point I think about schema research is that it points out that you might have the same information as somebody else in terms of if you were asked to repeat something on a test, you would repeat the exact same uh, information. But the embodied information, the way it's actually stored in your brain, is fundamentally different because it's attached to the neural network to uh, memories idiosyncratic memories, memories only you have, and feelings that you have. So this gets to the root of some of uh, the, the political disputes that people have, where even if they have the same information, uh, the, the affect side of that encoding of the information uh, can, can be an impediment. And then lastly, social representations research uh, basically tries to answer precisely that question. Why do people believe what they believe? It looks at how ideas uh, spread throughout a population and how, as they spread, they change and mutate. Uh, the, the, the beginning of this tradition really looked a lot at the media and how different types of media outlets would disseminate information in different ways, resulting in very different ideas ending up in people's heads throughout the population. Their, their example was psychoanalysis, but people since then have focused on many other topics. So I think to, I'm, I'm trying to uh, condense a whole lot of, of uh, theory into just a very short amount of time. So I'm gonna try to use this metaphor, hopefully it'll, it'll, uh, it'll work. Uh, but, so take a, a, uh, a constellation. A constellation is just a bunch of stars, and then we draw an imaginary line uh, between the stars, and then we create you know, some kind of figure. Well imagine that each of these stars is a piece of information, fact, a belief, an idea. And then the line that we draw, the imaginary line of the constellation, is like the narrative, the way that we combine all of these facts and these ideas into an explanatory narrative or a, uh, an ideology that makes sense of all of these facts. Now remember, this analogy doesn't work perfectly because each of those stars is not the same. We might look up in the sky and see the same stars, but the ideas in our two heads, even if they might see the seem the same, are going to be different because of the way that they're encoded and connected with our own memories and, and states of affect, emotion. 
But it's even worse than that when it comes to communicating with someone who has a different political uh, ideology. Because we're not always looking at the same set of stars. Uh, people of different political persuasions most often have drastically different sets of information that they then organize into an explanatory narrative. So it's like one person looking up at a, at a clear sky, having a bunch of facts that they organize into a narrative, and then someone else looking up into a cloudy sky where some of those stars are occluded or hidden behind the, the clouds. They just don't have the basic informational building blocks, and so it becomes very difficult to carry on a you know, productive conversation with them. Uh, I like this, this view because I think it challenges what uh, I think is our sort of implicit, unexamined view of how we came to believe what we believe today. I think implicitly, even if we don't think about this explicitly, we kind of view ourselves as uh, existing on top of an intellectual Mount Olympus, where we, we survey all the ideas in existence, and then we pick the, the best ones, and we adopt them as our own beliefs, and then all of the bad, stupid ideas we just leave out there, because we saw them, we examined them, but we decided that they weren't good, so we're not going to adopt them. Uh, this perspective kind of forces us to think about all of the, the, the arbitrary accidents that were involved in the development of our current beliefs, and also all of the accidents that were involved in the development of other people's beliefs, and hopefully might help uh, uh, debates and arguments be a little more uh, productive. So evolution, the first place to look uh, on the demand side is our, our brains, and within some evolutionary psychology, they have this kind of outdated view of of what uh, early Homo sapiens was like. So this is from a, uh, a bar in Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, this is the, the, the logo of the bar, but I think it kind of summarizes the view of some people where they say that, oh, you know, prehistoric Homo sapiens was a very violent, nasty bunch. You had these uh, alpha males that would dominate the women and dominate other men, and, and we were just in this competitive, uh, you know, as Hobbes put it, nature, red and tooth and claw, life was uh, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, but, you know, if you notice uh, here, the, the male is very, very much bigger than the female. Uh, the level of sexual dimorphism in Homo sapiens, that is the difference between, in size between males and females, is actually much more similar to the bonobo, our, our closest uh, relative. The reason why sexual dimorphism is important is because it indicates the extent to which we had a long history of either hierarchical social organization with high degrees of, of sexual dimorphism, like the chimpanzee, or low degrees of hierarchy, which is uh, reflected in low degrees of sexual dimorphism. If you don't have as hierarchical and competitive a society, males don't need to be as big so they can beat up other males. Um, but there's many examples. I can't go into all of the evidence. I'm just going to use the ones that are more, uh, the most easy to explain visually. So how are we different from our primate uh, relatives in, in, in this regard? Well, we have highly visible whites of our eyes. So we're constantly uh, telling other people where we're looking. I can see all the way over there. I can tell where, uh, where somebody is looking. Now, if we were mostly in competitive social situations, we probably wouldn't have evolved these, these, uh, this, this way of advertising our gaze. Instead, this is one piece of many pieces of evidence indicating that uh, what differentiates our species from our primate relatives is that we had a long period of uh, highly cooperative uh, social environments. Uh, and this is just you know, one piece among many. Oh, oops. I meant to uh, introduce that. You probably wouldn't guess that if you were all hooked up to fMRIs, uh, that your reaction to the following picture would better predict your political ideology than knowing the political ideology of your parents. But that's what research in uh, the US and Europe has found, that your reaction to these disgusting pictures is a better predictor of your political ideology uh, than even your parents' ideology, which is kind of crazy. Um, I'll, I'll go into why, but this is just the tip of the iceberg uh, of what I call elective affinity research. It's basically about correlations between psychological traits and political ideology, and it's quite striking. Uh, just to kind of summarize and kind of skip past all of that, 
the end picture you get after looking at uh, uh, research on these correlations between psychological traits and political ideology is that we have, this picture is from Atlas Shrugged. Uh, you might not know of Ayn Rand here, uh, lucky you, but in the US she's very popular, so everybody uh, uh, knows this. This is kind of a, uh, a classic uh, example of arguing that selfishness is a virtue and selfishness is great. Uh, this is Atlas, the, the, the proud capitalist, uh, saying, I'm not going to participate anymore, I'm going to go on strike, and you guys can figure it out. So this kind of represents uh, our sort of simian heritage, where we existed uh, many, many millions of years ago in societies kind of like those of chimpanzees today. Uh, competitive, you have alpha males trying to bully, you'll have alpha females trying to uh, gain dominance. Uh, and then you have the uh, more recent innovation of Homo sapiens, which was to develop uh, what's been called aggressive egalitarianism, and then psychologically, an egalitarian syndrome, a, a suite of psychological traits and tendencies that uh, provide a foundation for cooperative, uh, more equal social groupings, which is probably what uh, our species uh, was in for uh, most of the period of, of evolution after we branched off from our common ancestor with the chimpanzee. So we have these two, you know, human nature isn't just one or singular in this view, it's, it's uh, dual. Uh, we have both a, a highly competitive, uh, selfish heritage and a highly uh, uh, cooperative and egalitarian heritage as well. And we can kind of see this even today in the form of uh, what's been called uh, left psychology and right psychology. This is an attempt to categorize all of the various psychological trait, political ideology, correlations. And there's lots of them. And it's hard to kind of summarize them all under one short description. But if you do try, the best that I've seen is the left psychology is in favor of change. People are more open to novelty, open to new experiences. Uh, and they're more uh, against hierarchies. They, they have a, a, a stronger disgust at the idea of being dominated or bullied. Whereas right psychology uh, is uncomfortable with novelty. Uh, right psychology tends to, to view those disgusting pictures as more disgusting than people on the left in the, in the West, at least. Uh, and they tend to be more pro-hierarchy. They like a, a clear hierarchy so that they know who has authority, who's going to give orders, and who does not, and who's going to take orders. So what we might be seeing, really, is the, the uh, results of an evolutionarily stable strategy, or ESS. And you see evolutionarily stable strategies throughout the, the biological world. The most common one is the 50-50 sex ratio in our species, that generally uh, uh, we have about 50% male babies born, 50% female babies born. Uh, this kind of thing emerges out of the evolutionary process, uh, and perhaps this is what's going on, that the right ends up preserving what has come before. So any development, any technology, any uh, social institution that's worked well in the past, people with a right psychology end up uh, keeping that in existence in society. Then people with a left psychology will want something novel. They'll want to fight for some new thing, whatever that is. And if they succeed, like say in, in Sweden, the left fought for all sorts of uh, labor protections and a, a very generous social safety net, they won. And now even people on the right are broadly accepting of some of the basic social democratic uh, innovations that they introduced. So the right then, uh, after, if the left wins and introduces a novelty, the what right then fights for the new status quo. So it's the old status quo plus the new novelty that the left just introduced. Or the left might fight and lose, the novelty is rejected, and then the right continues to uphold the status quo. So this ESS, if this is actually a, a, an accurate description of, of what's going on in Homo sapiens right now, would help to guide social evolution uh, avoiding the two major problems. Uh, if you stay the same in evolution, generally that's not going to work very well because environments change. There's some exceptions, sharks do well, alligators work well, but most animals have to change uh, in order to survive. Uh, the left uh, 
offers that source of novelty, offers that source of change, and then the right keeps them from, from uh, mutating too quickly, mutating like cancer and destroying the, the, the sort of social uh, organization. Okay, so then the next area would be social psychological biases. What are the, the influences on the demand side that, that affect the way that we develop a political ideology? Uh, so there's motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, et cetera. Um, I, this would kind of take a little bit too long to, uh, to explain, so I'll skip past this. But if you're interested, look up Michael Gazzaniga's split brain research, where he introduces the idea of an uh, interpreter mechanism. That uh, what it feels like to think is not actually the way our brains are thinking. There's a lot going on in here that we don't have conscious access to. So, all of these biases in social psychology are revealing how the brain is actually working as opposed to how it feels like to think. So it feels like we're, we're judges. You know, we, we, we're presented with some political question, some moral question, we look over the two sides and we make a, a fair determination. Uh, but the accumulated evidence indicates instead that we act more like lawyers, or maybe more like uh, bad detectives who they initially have a, a suspicion about who did the crime, and then they just search for evidence to try to support the conviction for that person. Uh, so that's what it looks like our, our minds are actually set up to do. And this is revealed in a bunch of different ways. So one uh, pretty well-known bias is confirmation bias. We tend to search for confirmation for what we believe rather than doing the more scientific thing, which would be to search for disconfirmation of what we believe. When we're presented with an idea we don't like, then we search for disconfirmation. So you get results like this. Uh, you can easily ignore lots of evidence that goes against your beliefs, but then as soon as you see something that supports your beliefs, you're more likely to accept that and embrace that. Uh, then we have groupishness or in-group bias. And I think this cartoon sums it up very well how this particular social psychological bias affects our political beliefs or, or political ideology. We're very easy to form groups and once we've formed a group, it's very easy for us to act preferentially towards group members, and then sometimes act with prejudice to out-group members. And this is a, a very common, uh, you know, this is just pervasive in politics, whether it's uh, nationality, uh, nationalism, patriotism, uh, or partisanship. Uh, my ideological team versus your ideological team. Uh, this is particularly evident in the case of foreign policy, uh, because whenever, you know, particularly in the U.S., when wars are covered, uh, the other side, the out-group, isn't given the same type of coverage and attention as the in-group is. So instead of trying to counteract in-group bias, uh, media presentations often exacerbate in-group bias. Uh, one example of something that's similar to in-group bias, and it's related, uh, but it's also related to self-deception and problems in memory. So this was a, a 2013 uh, survey of people in the United Kingdom asking them to guess how many civilians had died as a result of the Iraq War. Uh, as you can see, the, the plurality chose less than 5,000 people. Uh, now, the scientific estimates uh, range from over a million in the Lancet's epidemiological uh, study, uh, about half a million in the PLOS, uh, PLOS medicine study, or over 200,000 just by counting the media reports of people dying by violence. So these reports did appear in the media. They were available. Uh, you could argue, though, that they weren't uh, given enough prominence. There wasn't enough attention given to these reports. Well, that's certainly plausible. Another thing that's going on is in-group bias. I don't like to feel bad about my group. My group, Brit British people, were involved in this war. We're partially responsible. Oh, I don't like that feeling. Uh, it also is related to problems with memory. Uh, oftentimes, uh, things that make us feel bad are relegated to inaccessible memory, so that then when we're asked for our estimate of how many people died, it might be something that we heard, but we can't access it. So we guess on the very, very low end. There's also belief persistence, when a belief uh, that we've had has been disproven, nonetheless, we continue to believe it. And this has been illustrated, I think, most clearly in this brilliant little experiment. 
So they gave two groups of people a case study that supposedly proved that risk-taking firefighters are the best firefighters. One group, they asked to write down their thoughts about why this relationship is true. So they started, okay, well, you know, maybe they make quicker decisions. Uh, so they enter burning buildings faster and save more people. Uh, they're, they're, they're less fearful. And then they might say, well, if they're a real risk taker, maybe they don't get married, so they work more hours, or you know, they drive faster, and they get to the fire, and they put it out better. Then these people were told, oh, whoops, uh, that case study we gave you, totally fake. There's no relationship whatsoever between risk taking and being a good firefighter. And what they found is, the people that were not asked to elaborate why this relationship was true, they were able to correctly remember that there's no relationship between risk taking and firefighting. But the people who had created this whole schematic structure in their brains explaining why this relationship was true, well, they could just cut out that part of the schema. Oh, that's false. I know that now. But they had this whole other elaborated schema that is not so easy to get rid of. And this is certainly the case with the development of political beliefs, uh, which are encoded in dense networks that are related to each other. And so you might learn that, oh, you know what? There, there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But I've had, I have another reason why we should have invaded. Uh, we were bringing democracy. So it's, it's very hard to get rid of political beliefs once they're, they're already in your head and very elaborated. Uh, then we have system justification. Basically, when people's uh, economic or political systems are threatened, they tend to respond defensively by uh, justifying that system, by reacting harshly to criticism. Uh, so this is kind of like the Stockholm Syndrome, where uh, uh, people were taken hostage in a bank and they started to develop uh, positive feelings towards their, their hostage takers. Uh, but overall, we just have uh, a feature that has been called cognitive conservatism. Once we have ideas encoded in schematic structures in our brain, it's really hard to get rid of them. So the transition between the supply side and the demand side. So there are some people that argue, like in this book, that uh, political beliefs are somehow just formed endogenously, entirely in our own heads. How? I have no idea. But the idea is that we just have our ideology, it comes from somewhere, and then we demand from the supply, from the news media, a uh, source that, that is congenial to our beliefs. So people who are right-wingers in the US, they demand this from the media system, and then they get Fox News. Yes, now I can watch Fox News, great. Because I already had these beliefs, and now I can confirm them. Uh, or if you're on the liberal side, MSNBC pops out of the supply side. Oh, great. Now my beliefs that I already had can be confirmed. However, MediaFX research is very clear on this. There is a massive amount of evidence that the media affects what we believe. Uh, certainly, there is some uh, uh, connection the other way around, that we demand something that's in accord with our beliefs. But there's undeniable evidence that the media shapes, at least partially, our political beliefs. So one uh, area of research is uh, cultivation theory, where they just look at differences between people who watch a lot of television and people who watch a little television. And they find all sorts of interesting differences from uh, how dangerous they think the world is. You can probably guess uh, which group of people thinks the world's more dangerous. Uh, down to being misinformed about the Gulf War down to supporting military uh, intervention uh, versus being less supportive, gender stereotyping versus less gender stereotyping, uh, et cetera. TV has a measurable impact in the US. The most commonly known forms of media influence go under priming, agenda setting, and framing. You might have heard this already. Uh, basically, the way that the news media frames a story, presents a story, uh, influences what you think about that subject. Uh, agenda setting, the media, by, the media will tell you what's important. If you guys only watched MSNBC over the past year, you would think by far the most important story in the world is whether the Russian government is controlling Donald Trump or not. Um, if you don't think that, that's an example of agenda setting. You have not been subject to the agenda setting power of MSNBC 
Therefore, you probably think that there are more uh, important issues other than that one. Uh, you would be wrong, of course. No. <laughs> uh, then there's uh, priming the, the ability of the media to, to focus attention on some things rather than others, like uh, George W. Bush, focus on you know what a nice guy he is and how much you'd want to have a beer with him rather than perhaps you know his uh, foreign policy beliefs or his lack of foreign policy beliefs. What the media focuses on can get us to focus on the same thing. Uh, then there's just direct influence. Uh, this is a, from a private research firm, Media Tenor. They've done really interesting research on this, just showing how uh, trends in media coverage. Uh, influence trends in public opinion. Uh, there have been very recent studies showing how the introduction of Fox News into some markets in the US influenced voting decisions and public opinion in those markets. There's another study that shows how uh, the position of Fox News on the dial. So if Fox News is low on the dial, it influences more of an effect. If it's high on the dial, it's less, because people who are just flipping through the channels are more likely to see Fox if it's you know, channel three or four versus if it's channel 208. Um, but there's also uh, evidence of media influence through omission, what the media doesn't show, the, the ideological perspectives that aren't found in the media system. And that I'll get to in just a second. So the, the, the theory of democracy is, it's supposed to work something like this. You have the people, all of the people, they debate freely in the public sphere that forms public opinion, uh, also in conversation with elected representatives, and elected representatives also debate in the public sphere. And this is how democracy basically is supposed to work. But when you have a mediatized public sphere, a public sphere dominated by media companies, you can have a perversion of this basic process. And I'll get into that. Um, basically, I'm going to start the story, just skip past all of this, and go straight to uh, newspapers. Uh, although, I'll then jump over to radio and television. But remember, facts don't have wings. Information is physical. We've always had to transport physical bits of information. These are the technologies that over time, we've used to, to do that. So the first public sphere was a, a, a bunch of salons and coffee shops where uh, a bunch of uh, Europeans could get together and read their newspapers and their books debate politics, and this is where the Enlightenment idea of democracy being a workable system comes from. Uh, today, that public sphere has been uh, dominated by television primarily, which is a very, it's a one-way form of communication. There's not a lot of debate. Uh, although now that might be changing a little bit with the internet, but it's a little too soon to, to, to tell. Uh, still, traditional media companies dominate on the internet, Although the internet changes very quickly, it could very well uh, evolve into something like the traditional public sphere. But in the United States, media consolidation means that 90% uh, of the most commonly viewed media outlets are owned by just six companies, which has some political economic effects. Uh, I'll just point out Stanley Ingber, a, a great legal scholar, uh, said, yeah, everyone has the right to free speech, but what use of that right, what use is that right if you have no means of speaking? Yeah, you can go into a park and you know, try to scream at people about your, your ideas, but today you can't compete with television or radio. It's not the same public sphere that we used to have. Uh, then there's, there's a, the neoclassical way of doing political economy of media, making simplified models and then drawing conclusions from them. Uh, I don't really have enough time to go into them, but I think they're interesting. I write a little bit about them in the, in the book. The, the conclusions, though, is that what the news media produces today is a public good. Um, it's non-rivalness. My consumption of the New York Times webpage doesn't affect your consumption of the New York Times webpage. Uh, the marginal cost of supplying that is next to zero. It's the electricity to run the server to send that info to my computer and your computer. Uh, it's not excludable. It's very difficult to exclude people. Although I found that some people will say, oh no, they, it is excludable. There's a paywall. And I'll just be like, oh, you guys don't know how to get it around? Okay, never mind. Uh, but there's always a way of getting around the, the paywall. So basically what you have is a market failure where uh, instead of producing the optimal output in terms of political information, debate, and competing perspectives, the market doesn't uh, supply those willing to pay the marginal cost, which is basically nothing. 
and it doesn't reward the producers of news uh, for the, the total social value of what they produce, which also brings us to the, the economic troubles of the, the news media in the US, at least the, uh, the print media. As an example of the fact that information is a public good, uh, you can, unfortunately my book was priced for academic libraries, uh, so it's ridiculously expensive. I also have a, a self-published earlier version that's much, much longer and isn't edited, so you can get that. But you can also just download it for free on the internet because somebody that I sent the, the electronic copies to uh, uploaded it to the internet. This is what I mean by information being a public good. You can't really control it. Uh, so you can just download it for free there if you like reading it electronically. Um, then effects of, some political economic effects of the, the media system. So you have commercial pressure. Uh, you can't displease advertisers. You need to be worried about that. Uh, also, you couldn't take it. You can see that at the very bottom. Uh, media companies don't want to offend their viewers. Uh, if they have some story about you know, uh, uh, something that your team, your country did that was bad, they might not want to focus on that so much because people are going to feel icky and they might change the channel. And that's no good for that. Uh, and then you also have people's demands, what they like to watch. They like, like to watch cheap entertainment. Uh, they don't want to get too much information, get too deep into a, a topic, especially a depressing topic. So you have all of these aspects of commercial bias affecting what news people do get. Uh, then when we talk about bias in the US, we're usually talking about ideological bias. You'll have some people saying, Oh, the liberals control the media, and it's a liberal bias, and then you have the liberal saying it's a conservative bias. Well, one, you have simple commercial bias. The media has a bias in favor of what is going to attract more eyeballs that they can sell to advertisers. That's their business model. Those are their customers, the advertisers. Uh, whoops. But you have you know, all of the, these, these really rancorous debates about whether the media is conservative or liberal. Basically, the research, I think, shows that, yes, the media does have a liberal bias when it's focusing on social issues. So in this case, a, uh, a Christian NFL player is kind of disliked, but a gay uh, NBA player is kind of liked by the media. Uh, the reasons for that, it's the, even the reasons here are partially commercial. Uh, the media particularly wants women and young people to advertise to because women make most household purchasing decisions, and because young people are viewed as capable of developing lifelong brand loyalties. Uh, women and, and young people in the United States tend to be more liberal. So that's another part of the reason, in addition to journalists' own beliefs, that is behind the liberal bias on social issues. However, when it comes to foreign policy, uh, there's a clear conservative bias, or pro-imperial bias, in US media coverage. Uh, as illustrated here, and on economic issues, there's also a clear conservative bias. It's rather interesting to see uh, people arguing for liberal or conservative bias because they almost always talk past each other. They don't realize, or seem to realize that, in the liberal bias there's good evidence on social issues. On economics and foreign policy, there's good evidence for a conservative bias. Uh, then there's the propaganda model. Uh, the, the size, ownership, and profit orientation of firms. Um, I've talked about that a little bit already. The influence exerted by advertisers. Uh, source bias is an often overlooked uh, force of, of influence in the political economy of media, where you want to get authoritative sources, so you prefer going to the government. Also, the government will subsidize your uh, information gathering. How? by organizing press conferences. So instead of you having to traipse all over the world or the city trying to collect information, you can just sit in a nice uh, air-conditioned conference room and then write down what the government spokesperson says. Uh, this is an often overlooked form of, of, of uh, political economic bias. Then there's black, basically, uh, pressure groups trying to pressure the media into uh, focusing less on one issue and more on another issue. And then you have the ideology of journalists and media owners themselves. Surveys of journalists in the United States have found that they uh, lean to the liberal side on social issues and to the conservative side on economic issues. 
And lastly, you've got occasional direct government influence. I think most infamously, uh, in the case of uh, the New York Times reporting on weapons of mass destruction, where uh, government officials would feed a uh, journalist for the Times uh, false information, and then the Times would get to run this propaganda story. Uh, the church uh, committee hearings in the 1970s revealed uh, a wide network of relationships between the CIA and basically every single top media outlet in the United States. Uh, we haven't had a church committee <laughs> for quite a while, so we don't know what it looks like now, but you know, it's not exactly crazy to extrapolate uh, and guess at what it might be. Uh, the news media in the United States is, is in trouble. Uh, Trump has helped the failing New York Times. Their, their uh, subscriptions have gone up by 60%, so maybe they're not so failing anymore. Uh, but this is, a, this is a problem. I'll, I'll skip past this for now. Uh, the conclusions, basically, looking at the supply side are uh, the news media is the most important force in the ecology of information, and there are very clear pressures keeping some perspectives, some arguments, some pieces of information out of the supply. And that's really where media influence uh, comes in, in the United States at least. Uh, primarily the ideas that are favored are either those ideas that are attractive to or already held by people with power. Uh, you know, on, the, on the margins, you know, uh, women and young people in terms of that marginal power as consumers, but much more importantly, uh, from advertiser influence by source bias, etc. So quickly, in comparing media systems, uh, the, you look around the world at media systems in different countries, and you see that you have this constant tension between what I think Raymond William calls uh, PAP and propaganda. So PAP is just fluff, junk. That's the problem in commercialized media systems, that you'd rather have you know, stories about puppies and, and uh, uh, you know, sports stars rather than real uh, important information about politics. And then propaganda, state media being controlled as to what they can and can't uh, portray. Uh, the, there's been a lot of studies comparing the effects of different types of media systems around the world. The conclusions are pretty clear across the board. Uh, public service media systems, media systems where a well-funded, uh, government-funded, public service media exists and has a large market share, tend to have more knowledgeable uh, populations. There tend to be less uh, or smaller knowledge gaps uh, between ethnicities and income groups and educational groups. Uh, basically, what you, you tend to see is that because they're not subject to commercial pressure, their journalists do a better job at informing the public. Uh, key here is uh, having de jure independence from the government. So if you have legal, in most country studies, if you have legal independence from government, that ends up producing de facto independence from government, or uh, effective uh, independence from government. There are exceptions, but that's the, the general trend. So it seems like the ideal media system would be one, in which uh, a public service media forms the core, and that then influences even the private commercial media. Okay, so the, the, in conclusion, uh, there have been a lot of comparative media scholars and just uh, media scholars in general who have offered suggestions as to what an ideal media system for democracy would look like, because the current one in the United States is, I think, we can, most people will agree, uh, it's a joke. Uh, it, it produced uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, I still laugh every time I hear that on TV. But, I mean, this is not, this was hardly surprising to me, whereas lots of people in the US were shocked out of their minds. I, you know, was just, I, I, I didn't break a sweat. I was just still chewing my hamburger at the time, and, you know, whatever. Uh, this cartoon kind of illustrates it, but there's a, there are suggestions on how to fix it. You might not be able to see it, so I'll, I'll kind of zoom, I'll, I'll highlight some things. This is, a, I think, James Curran's suggestion for how a, a democracy-appropriate media system would be designed. So first you'd have the private sector, basically the status quo system that we have today, but with some of the best content regulations uh, from Europe, or you could even use it from the US. There used to be a thing called the Fairness Doctrine in the US, 
that prevented uh, highly ideological outlets like Fox News and Rush Limbaugh. Uh, that was gotten rid of at the end of the 1980s, and that's when the, the right-wing media really took off in the US. Uh, so you'd have the private sector basically keeping that as is, but then you'd have that supplemented by what he calls the civic center, basically following the Dutch model, which is to say, okay, if you are an organized political group over a certain size, we will give you a government grant to produce your own media outlet, and you'll have uh, television time, you can turn that into an internet outlet, whatever, but that's a way of guaranteeing uh, ideological diversity within the media system. Then you've got the professional sector, which is basically modeled on the BBC or Al Jazeera, which is essentially a whole bucket load of money that you give out to experienced journalists, and you just say, here, we're going to pay you. What do you need uh, to, to do your job? And then we're going to you know, stay away from you and let you do whatever you want to do. Now, Al Jazeera and BBC aren't perfect. Uh, BBC can still note traces of, of bias. Al Jazeera, certainly when they're talking about the Gulf states, uh, you, can, you can notice traces of bias. If you look at uh, Arabic Al Jazeera, ooh, that's more like a, uh, uh, a Fox News or, or worse of the, the Arab world. But leaving that aside, then the social market sector would follow the Scandinavian model, where they give grants to uh, ethnic minority groups so that they can produce media for their own group in their own language uh, and also to political minorities. So what if you, you, you're a small uh, political group like uh, the, the Maoist movement in the United States? There is one. They're very, very small. Uh, so if you're a political minority, you might get a small grant so that you can at least uh, put your ideas out there and then people can reject them and call you crazy just as they could before but at least they would know what your perspective is. And then lastly, the, the core of the model would be modeled on the, the German system, uh, where you have a, a, a public service TV where all political persuasions get their own amount of time on that main channel. So that if people are just turning on their TV just to see the news, they're going to see an ideologically diverse uh, uh, presentation. So lastly, uh, uh, when people ask, you know, what do I think of the media? What, what, what is its power? I say, basically, the, in the United States, the media is God. But it's not like you know, the Abrahamic God, where it's the only one. It's more like a God in Greek uh, uh, mythology, where there are many other gods, too. There are many other influences over what people believe uh, in politics. And then within that God, like Zeus, which the media is, it's not a monolith. It's like you have the entire Hindu pantheon inside that one god. Everything from Brahma, uh, the creator, represented by the internet, to uh, Shiva, the destroyer, represented by Fox News or News Corp. <laughs> um, but that's, that's my opinion about the, the power that the media exerts. And I think democracies need to pay attention to building media systems that are appropriate for democracy. Otherwise, you get a situation like that painting at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions, uh... um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, some housekeeping issues here. Uh, first, we have approximately like 25 minutes for um, Q and A answer, uh, Q question and answers. I think Peter has prepared a, a special technology related kinds of questions. Oh yeah, it's all the way at the beginning. There we go. It's very innovative. I, so. I forgot to uh, mention at the beginning. Uh, if, you, if you'd rather not, like, you know, say your your answer or say your question out loud, you can go to this website share.youreply.mobi, M-O-B-I. It'll ask you for a number, and then you just enter in 640, and you'll see a, a chat room, and then that that chat room is where you can ask a question. So if you have a really nasty, mean, critical question. <laughs> This is where you can put it in, and you can be anonymous. <laughs> well, we can still choose the uh, traditional way to voice uh, your, your, your traditional questions. And the most important thing, there are books there. Um, if you ask for um, an autograph copy, I think people will be quite happy with that, uh, even though it's free online. So uh, <laughs> I, I do have one question to start with, because um, it's part of my personal interest. You know, I confess that I can't understand the entire uh, presentation form for obvious reasons, I'm not a political psychologist, 
but I do study something about future studies, visuality, etc. Um, do what I understand, right now, everything is transformed by the IT revolution, technology, AI, machine learning, and all that. Do you think that will have an impact on your research? For instance, when you go for the social media, you know, what you're reading is not only provided by the media, but it's also provided by AI and machine learning. And they guess what we are looking for, and they fit us the contents. So that might have transformed the entire logic of the evolution between um, critical psychology, human nature, biology, and media and all that. So how would you evaluate the impact of technology on, on the entire setting? Uh, that's a really good question. And it, it reminds me of one time when I was massively wrong uh, very recently because I didn't account for the impact of, of technology. So in late 2015, a friend of mine from India asked me, uh, so who's going to win the, the Democratic and Republican nomination? And I said, oh, it's, it's very clear. Uh, uh, Clinton and Jeb Bush are going to win because they won the money primary. They won. The, they they raised the most amount of money. And traditionally, if you raise the most amount of money, you can buy more propaganda. You can get more uh, media attention because you're considered a, a, a important, serious candidate. So that's my best guess. I'm very confident about that. Uh, well, as we know, uh, Trump ran away with the, the nomination, and Bernie Sanders came very close to beating Clinton. Things that absolutely shocked me. But I think the, the key thing is, is uh, uh, new information technology has really changed the public sphere. And I, I think the key thing in this last election was uh, social media, uh, certainly for, for Sanders. Trump, there's a little less evidence of, of the internet uh, helping him. Uh, he, got, he got enough help from the traditional media, uh, which slathered billions of dollars of, of free coverage on him. But, uh, that's this last election. In the future, you mentioned uh, AI. I just saw something about how uh, they're developing, or they have developed uh, an AI program that can very uh, realistic, or can write very realistic comments and even short articles online. So that could be weaponized for use by governments or corporations to just spam uh, places on the internet, including social media, uh, to try to spread their, their view of things. Uh, in India, the, 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 the BJP has been massively successful at using social media. They're scarily successful at using that. So they, their, their degree of control, I think, is, uh, uh, has been cemented in large part because of technology. Um, so there, there are scary things about it. There's also positive things, because people who could, you know, 20 years ago, never get their ideas out to the public, like a Bernie Sanders, now at least have a means of doing so. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to gauge. The other thing is that traditional legacy media companies still dominate on the internet. They're still the most read uh, news sites are you know, your New York Times, your CNN, even on the internet. So it's, it's really hard to gauge, but I think you know, changes are coming very fast and it's gonna be interesting to watch. Uh, a very quick uh, for the questions you mentioned is cultivation theory. Uh, does the price to television viewers? Uh, does it also apply to the internet users? Oh, that's a really good, that's a that's not even a good question. That's a good research <laughs> paradigm. Um, I wonder if anyone has done that. Has anyone has anyone heard of that? That's fascinating. That I, I wonder if you would see. Uh, I wonder what you would see. But yeah, that, that, I think that's worthy of of actually putting into practice. Brody's from your next book. <laughs> uh, okay, we can open the floor to uh, any questions that you find relevant, or if you have other questions about the media, uh, American politics, or anything, I think uh, Peter can open an answer. So, um, questions, raise your hand. Anu, <laughs> please. Uh, I'd like to, oh, sorry. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the impact yeah, thanks for a very interesting uh, talk, and I look forward to reading the book. I actually bought it. Uh, I'm not gonna. So I actually contributed five dollars to Peter. So. Um, you said that the news media is a primary, primary source for shaping our ideas, and I'm, so I don't know any of the research about this, but I'm just sort of spitballing. Um, I, I would question that. So. In your own intellectual history, you picked up a raggedy ass book when you're 12 years old from the parent's shell. And I'm wondering, like, like so it, does it matter at what point in our lives that we actually start uh, consuming the media? So most of us, when we're kids, we don't pay any attention to the media at all. 
our worldview and our information around us is, I would think, most likely shaped by our parents, but maybe also our, our schooling, and maybe also our cartoons and Disney movies and stuff. And you know, I didn't start reading the newspaper until I was a grad student, like an MA student. Like, I didn't read the newspaper at all. So when you say that the news media is our primary source of political information, I'm wondering if you're talking about a specific class of people, like college-educated people that are political. Because that's another thing, is that most people are apolitical, or at least over 50% of Americans don't vote, right? So most, most people are outside of the political process. They don't think about it at all. They don't watch the news even. Um, so what, what, is, what is the research on this, this claim that the news media is the number one primary source of our political ideology? I know, that's a good question. I, I should have actually gone into the, the uh, research on public ignorance. Uh, you know, as you said, the, the level of political information in the U.S. is laughable. My favorite piece of, of that research is that uh, about a third of people in the U.S. think that the communist uh, tenant of from each according to his ability to each according to his need is actually in the United States Constitution. One out of three people believe that. <laughs> So anyway, that, that's my favorite example. But yeah, I would, I would say it's not so much the class of people as the class of information. So anything that's about uh, what's going on in Congress today, uh, uh, what uh, laws are being proposed, what are the, the, the politicians, that are, the candidates that are thinking about running, unless you live near a capital city or, or somehow can see it with your own eyes and hear it with your own ears, that information is only going to get to you in some mediated form. Now, you might not actually you know, read the, the, the news or watch TV news, but the source of that information is ultimately going to be from the news media. You might have a conversation with your parents or your, your friends, your teacher might tell you something, but the only way that that physical piece of information got from Washington, D.C. to you know, wherever it is that you are is fundamentally through the media's logistical system. Um, but yeah, like all of those, those sources are also extremely important in, in developing worldviews. And probably, you know, uh, popular media and entertainment media are arguably more uh, influential in, in making a really basic ideological perspective. It, might, it won't be, you know, one where you have a lot of political ideas, because most people don't have many at all in the U.S. But, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to your, your gist of how the world works, uh, there's a, a meme that it captured that idea very well. Uh, it was uh, uh, what's the Harry Potter, and it showed like uh, Dumbledore as uh, Bernie Sanders, and then you know, all these other characters, you know, teaching kids that uh, the the right and the, the, the liberal centrists centrists are bad. And you could just imagine, yeah, like influences even like that could could affect the development of a political ideology. So yeah, I, I just. That statement is, is more focused on the class of information I'm talking about, and less about the class of people, if that makes sense. Well, actually, yeah, maybe I would think you know, Mr. Chan, he can represent the supply side bias. Uh, as you must have the head of RTHK, where you were there in Hong Kong, so. Yeah. yeah, I just want to ask like, a better question. So you have placed on um, public media say you have just zero at the BBC. I just wonder what is your views um, on the uh, mainstream Televisions in in United States, say uh, CBS, NBC, and ABC, are they uh, doing a good job in um, reporting Hillary Clinton, Trump? Are they biased? Are they uh, playing fairly? Are they good media or bad media? What is your views on the mainstream media, NBC, CBS, and ABC? Uh, Before uh, yeah. I think, let me interrupt. The bit is, I think, uh, however, is a message here. Okay, so uh, we advise that uh, some cars might go outside without the parking permit. So in case there are some cars around, just go outside. Uh, yeah, these these are the numbers I think we do have to read uh, now. So um, that's the last one. <laughs> okay, sorry. No problem. Uh, to, to answer it very uh, simply, I, I consider that the service provided by NBC, CBS, ABC is essentially a non-invasive lobotomy. Uh, the, the evidence that we have is that people who watch those sources are actually less informed than people who watch no news at all. 
That, I don't understand how that happens. Um, I, probably because people who watch no news are going on the internet and, and getting information, but uh, I, I think they do a, a horrendous job, not because they're biased in favor of Clinton or biased in favor of Trump, but simply because they respond to the commercial imperatives that they have to in order to survive as commercial media enterprises. Uh, I think that's the, the, the fundamental problem. Like that, I would rank that number one, and then two would be perhaps uh, uh, the code of professional journalism in the US about what's newsworthy, what is not, what's a good source, what's not. But over and above, over and above anything else, I would say it's just the commercial pressures that they know they're gonna lose eyeballs if they do stories on climate change, for instance. Like uh, Chris Hayes was talking about how he tried to do climate change coverage, but you know the ratings dropped down, so he had to go back to Russiagate. And you know, I, I feel for them, I, I, I understand. Like they, they would go out of business or, or be destroyed by a competitor if they actually uh, did a more ideal version of their job. But I, I just think it's, I, I can't even stand to watch it when I'm in the US. It's just too depressing. I think they're doing a horrendous job. Uh, any other questions? That's not to say anything about yeah. the I, I, just, I just have a question about the media, the definition of media uh, now in modern days. Uh, when I was a kid, a four or five kids, uh, I got my uh, first TV and I watch it uh, something like uh, five to six hours each day. <laughs> but nowadays, the, the world has turned upside down. The time I spend on uh, WeChat, uh, on WhatsApp, is much, much more than the, the TV, TV time. I, I, I get my TV uh, off all the day. I didn't turn it on, uh, maybe I didn't on just once a week or something, something like that. So the term uh, public media uh, nowadays may be different. So what I am uh, in contact with daily is the, the WhatsApp group the, together with, with you, maybe the WhatsApp group together with you, mm -hmm. then the information I got is not a, a it's, it's just from a, a, a friend's group uh, or some, 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 some kind of social group I can approach. It's not from uh, the media group. So the, the ideology that uh, have to form uh, uh, from my from, from from this environment is actually deviated from uh, that public media model. Uh, that's what I think. Then, based on that theory, we may have a uh, an other kind of uh, say, for example, ideology formation model rather than a, a strict on the media side. Media side. Uh, that's my uh, sharing. Yeah, no, I I think that's a really good point because what I what most of the research has focused on. Uh, in these areas has been the old legacy model of journalism where you have a, an editor who kind of curates the news for you by telling journalists you know, what to, to cover and then uh, editing their stories and they put it in the newspaper and then you read the newspaper and, and the editor is your curator. Whereas now, oftentimes our friends are our editors or our curators. You go on their, their Facebook page or, or WhatsApp group and they choose what articles you read. However, uh, on the internet still, the actual producers of those stories are still the traditional journalists. If we didn't have them, we would be in a worse position. Uh, you know, the, as David Simon, the, the creator of uh, The Wire put it, he's like, you know, because all these small local newspapers in the US are closing down, it's like a paradise for local government corruption. Because we don't have any, any, any local journalists going to, to city board meetings and, and planning commission meetings because they're still the ones that are producing the actual raw material of, of journalistic output. It's the, the major change so far has been in who gets to curate the news. And now it's more, uh, at least for those of us like you and me that are more on social media, it's our friends that are, that are curating the news. Maybe a secondary curation, because still, you know, if they go to the New York Times or Monthly Review or whatever, they're, they're first getting the editor curating and then they're curating the curators. But the producers of the news are still the, the basic journalists, and at least the problem in the U.S. is that we're losing uh, basic journalism, and so we're, we're kind of that's that's something worrying there. We have uh, one question. Oh, that's great. Last uh, Okay. Well, anonymous. Um, 
what can we do now to fix the media now to let them get closer to the ideal one? Well, I really like that, that proposal by James Curran of, of creating a very pluralistic uh, media system. But it's, it's funny because, you know, when I combine that question with your question, um, I'm reminded that, you know, all of these proposals were really talking about the old legacy system where, where people, you know, just looked at newspapers, TV, radio, and not so much on the, the internet. But I think that, you know, what this proposal offers is how to finance the production of news. Right now, we're, we're losing money that goes into the production of news, hiring, paying journalists to actually go do the hard work. So if we had a system like you know, James Curran's suggested system, we would at least have the product put out there, and then perhaps they wouldn't be disseminated in the same traditional way of in a newspaper, on TV, on radio, but you know, they would still get disseminated, this time instead through social media, or WhatsApp group, your, your, your Facebook, your Twitter, what have you. But the key thing about this proposal and, and similar proposals like this is, um, there's an article in the Columbia Journalism Review, they called it the Uncle Sam solution, that we need the government to step in and open the, its pocketbook because revenue, traditional revenue sources for, for media in the US are drying up. Uh, and we have to pay journalists. So in terms of fixing the media system, I'd say you know, that, that, that proposed pluralistic model of, of many different kinds of government funding, as long as there is uh, robust democratic control over the government's funding of the media, um, I, I kind of lean towards a, a more Republican system as opposed to just purely democratic where you can have a tyranny of the majority situations happening. A more Republican system where you have, say, like a uh, a board of governors where a slight majority are elected by journalists themselves, and then the rest of the board is elected by the general public. Something like that. that those are the ideas that I found most persuasive. And these aren't my ideas, I'm just taking them from other people and putting them together. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have other questions? Okay, I think this is the final one. Uh, short answer, no, because I, I don't know what is unbiased. Like, bias in the sense is basically just describing how our brains operate, that we, we tend to act like uh, snowballs going down a mountain, you know, just accumulating more and more information around the, the core. So I, I don't know where the objective position is that we can then compare other people's ideologies and then say, oh, well, there's a big gap between objective truth and your biased opinion, so therefore we know that you're biased. I just don't see any way out of that. So what I would, would argue for instead is just the, the, the greatest degree of pluralism and debate so that you know, we, we're all going to have some form of bias, but at least if we're constantly exposed to uh, uh, arguments that attack our bias, that go against confirmation bias, that go against in-group bias, that try to fight against these psychological tendencies, I think that's the closest we're going to get to being unbiased. But I just don't know of how we could define what the objective, you know, unbiased truth position is that we could then measure anything else against. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think if, uh, due to the time constraint, I think we better a closed floor. If you're interested to learn further uh, from this topic, come to take the MGP class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Peter Getty, for the very interesting sharing. I think uh, we are all looking forward to reading your book. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.